So first of all, I'll give you an introduction of uh, what my talk is gonna be about. And then I will talk about, you know, why you want to not use Zig. And I'll talk about why you want to use Zig. And then I will talk about um, how to use Zig, not, as, not just as a programming language, but more like a compiler. And finally, we're gonna go into, you know, what is, you know, the whole, the, the name of the topic, um, build.zig. What, what is it? What do you do with it? And uh, what are the problems of using it? And finally, uh, I will talk about, you know, this package manager, which is actually very new in Zig. Um, and also, uh, lastly, I'll mention about, you know, I will actually mention, um, you know, what the future holds for all the, all, all the material I cover in the, you know, in the talk. So I promise I will be subjectively objective, which means I am opinionated. I will tell you what it is. I will tell you exactly how I feel about certain things. So um, there is not gonna be any sugarcoating um, because I do believe that honesty between engineers are probably the most important thing, um, especially when you're evaluating a new language or a new, a new project. And also I'm not gonna try to sell, sell you anything. This, but this talk has nothing to do with my project at all. Um, so here, so first of all, um, I am actually what I would consider myself to be a beginner of Zig. I'm not, a, I'm not in the core team at all. I do not, you know, I have no any interest at all in the success of Zig. Um, however, I did choose Zig as the language for my new project. There's a reason, uh, I will go through the reasons. And your reasons for using or trying Zig may or may not be exactly the same, but you know, at least it's my experience of how I use Zig. Also, again, because I only have one hour and I have a lot of slides, so there is really no way for me to go through Zig as a programming language. Um, I will only talk about the syntax if we need to understand certain things. But given the fact that every one of you actually has done C, C++, or Rust, those things should come really natural to you. And, uh, oh yeah, uh, just uh, one of the disclaimer, as I said, this is what it is. It's not how it should be. So if you have questions, say why is Zig done things certain way? I don't know. It was designed this way. Uh, there are reasons, of course, uh, and I agree with many of the reasons. But I cannot give you, uh, I cannot tell you, you know, it, where it should be. I only can tell you what it is right now at the master branch at this point. So I'm not a C++ um, expert at all. So if I talk about C++ and then if I tell you things that makes absolutely no sense, you, know, that you can tell me, but that, uh, that's my understanding of how C++ works. Same thing with make files. I'm also not an expert on make files, how make system works, how artifact system works. You are probably much more expert, um, has more exp expertise on this. However, I do like languages and I'm very into programming languages. Anyways. So why do I use the name WTF? The reason is actually I rewrote a series of blogs about Zig. It's on Zig.news. Um, I usually, on slides, I usually don't like to give links because no one's ever gonna remember all the URLs. Um, just do Google, you know, just do a Google on Zig.news. You should see my blogs. And somehow, because I end up using, the reason why I use it, WTF is initially, I was trying to learn Zig, was like, you know, it makes no sense the way they do certain things. So I, so I just say, you know, WTF. And then as I learn more, I realized that WTF probably makes sense, but I just somehow then it just stuck. So I ended up using WTF as usually the name for all my blog posts. So if you go to Zig um, webpage, they will tell you that Zig is a general purpose programming language. Interestingly, it's the one of the few languages that actually say it's not only a language, it's also a tool chain, which I think is actually very unique. And Zig, um, like other, unlike other languages, their conference is actually not, you know, Zig Conf, or, you know, um, it's actually called Software You Can Love, which, um, so if you're looking for a Zig conference, you need to Google Software You Can Love. You don't, um, don't Google ZigConf because it, it doesn't exist. Um, the last one just happened in June in Vancouver. And the one before that was in Milan. And I know 2024 is gonna be in Milan again. The reason is because somebody in the core team happens to reside in that city. 
<laughs> However, I think uh, one of the things that Zig originally got famous or somewhat famous uh, within the small circle of people who actually know what that is, is that it's considered a better C. Um, I will give you my opinion on why, whether that is true, but um, that is how it became famous because it's considered a better C. Um, I don't think it, they are the, they are, I, you know what, we'll talk about that. And then uh, another thing is that it used the term general purpose programming language, but somehow in many of the talks, you will see also in the Wikipedia um, article, you will see Zik is considered uh, what they call a systems programming language. Um, and so this is, uh, so that's exactly where C is. So first of all, let's talk about the problems of Zik. So why not Zik? One thing, uh, as you know, 2020, uh, the, this year's, uh, this year's uh, what do you call it, uh, popularity you know, listing from the Stack Overflow um, shows Zig at 0.7%. It's uh, exactly between Prolog and Fortran. Um, and uh, you know, my favorite language before Zig, actually I still like Haskell the most, is only one, it's still, you know, it's at least more than twice as popular as Zig. But Zig is a very new language. So, so if you talk about, if you wanna learn a language because, of popul because it's popular to incline jobs, um, may not be a good idea. But there's actually, interestingly, Zig is considered one of the highest paid um, job. I think it's because there are so few people who actually work full time. So the, the, the data is skewed. And another thing why it's not a good idea to use Zig is that um, the current version is 0 0.10. And uh, the one I've been using is 0 0.11, but it's a pre-release. I have no idea when it's going to be released. It's probably going to be this year, but I can't guarantee that. I can tell you that it breaks. Some things will always break almost every day. Um, however, it's very usable. If, as long as you don't upgrade your version every time, every day like I do. Um, and then um, I know there are a lot of people who in the community who's been asking, you know, when's 1.0? And the only thing I can tell you that it was, it was, it was said by Andrew that 99.99% 1.0 will not be ready by end of year this year. In other words, the earliest, if it ever happens, is, not, is gonna be 2024. It's, um, it's one of those things that it's ready when it's ready. So um, you know, if you're looking for 1.0 before you start learning a language, um, Zig's not ready yet. Another reason, uh, so the first quote, don't use Zig in production is actually a quote by Andrew himself, who is the creator of the Zig. So he always tell you not to use it in production. And there are really no corporate support at all um, because the only two projects I know of that actually uses Zig um, that people somewhat knows about, one is called Tiger Beetle, which is a financial database uh, out of South Africa. The other one is Bun. If you are in JavaScript, you probably heard of a Bun before. Uh, in fact, um, Bun is actually located in San Francisco. Uh, I know Jared, I met Jared, and I actually went to one of his uh, Zig meetup, uh, I think was maybe two or three weeks ago. Um, and there were only about five, five of us. So um, as you can see, uh, so it's actually, if you're looking for something that has you know, corporate support for longevity or for you know, all the different things that comes with corporate support, this is not yet. And lastly, do you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, I will talk about Uber actually. Um, but they actually don't use Zig. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it. It's a little bit different. The way they use it is different from how Bun, where they write um, Bun or um, Tiger Beetle because they write their whole project in Zig. Uber does not. Uh, and by actually, in, thanks for mentioning that. I will talk about Uber. And um, another thing is that it is a very, the core team, uh, I'm not in the core team. Um, there are about three or four people in the core team within that picture. Um, so Andrew is the one, um, no, like the, the one right next to me uh, on the lower right hand, hand corner. 
And I just thought this picture is funny because uh, no one takes picture while facing the sun, but I do that. Uh, so I did a uh, selfie with them uh, while doing this because I'm the only one wearing sunglasses. <laughs> so I didn't know. Anyways, um, it's a very young idealistic team, which means um, they are very, um, I'm, probably, uh, I'm probably overreacting, but the vibe I got while meeting with them is that um, in general, they are very, you know, open source is great. Um, nonprofit is great. They are very anti-VC, anti-Silicon Valley, anti-large um, corporation like Fang, especially. You know, they are, I definitely get that vibe out of it. Um, so, you know, you know um, because we, I live here, right? I, I've been here all my life. So the view I have of certain things are very different from when I went there. I felt like there's a, almost a culture shock um, in the sense that, but the, however, uh, this is the, also the same reason why I actually will recommend Zig, but I'll talk about it later. Um, but the, this is uh, just a very honest opinion is that it's a very young idealistic core team. So I, uh, before I started using Zig, I actually wrote a trial program. I initially wrote it in Julia, um, and then I rewrote it in Zig. And this is the, line, the, the difference in line of code between the two. I chose both two languages because those are both new to me. Um, I've never used Julia before I tried this thing. I've never used Zig before I tried this thing. So I thought it's a fair comparison. It's not to do, it doesn't tell you, you know, which one's better, which one's worse. It just tell you the effort I need to put in to write the same, um, same program to achieve feature parity between the two. So I gave you a lot of reasons why not to use Zig. So why do I even have a talk about Zig? So yes, Zig is, you know, it's, it's very obscure when it comes to popularity. However, for people who actually use it, it's actually the most, one of the most loved languages out there. And it's only behind, I think, Rust and uh, Elixir. For if you believe in those kind of, you know, posts, right? And um, I know, so you, all of you, I think almost most of you are much smarter than I am. I always consider C++ or Rust to be very, very difficult to learn and to do well in. And there's a lot of uh, working, the size of working memory to, to be a good C++ for programmers has always been out of reach for me. I just feel like I can't retain every good practice you need to learn in order to be very good at C++. Um, so Zig in comparison is very small in comparison to C++ or Rust. And a lot of things, as I told you that in the beginning, I always say WTF. However, the more I learn about it, things just work. They just make sense. Um, it's a sense of that, you know, it's like, oh yeah, it kind of, it should be done this way. And it does do this way. So everything makes sense, at least for me. And I, earlier I said, you know, it's a very young idealistic um, core team, but I love the team. I think the people are awesome. They're very welcoming. They are very honest and they are, you know, um, they're very fun bunch. Um, that's a, another, um, actually, the second person on the left is actually the founder of, um, is, is Jerry, he's the founder of Bun. And uh, the person behind me, um, King is actually also one of the core team members. So um, it's, I just love the team. I just think the team is awesome. Um, and I think young idealistic is great for any new project. So here, another reason is that um, what I'm building requires very high performance. Um, this is not even a brag or anything. Um, I don't even, don't even believe this, you know, honestly, but I actually happen to use a web server that is actually originally written C, but um, I'm um, actually, um, uh, Rene, who is the person on the left, uh, left lower corner, he actually um, ported and also like uh, embedded the, the C web server in a Zip um, server called Zap. 
and I happened to use Zap. And this is actually how I was introduced to uh, Zik initially. So this is actually, he actually did a performance test because for what he needs, he also needs very fast um, web server performance. This is of course not everything. This is not, you know, the best, you know, um, people love web server performance. I don't know why. So as you can see, Zig, the Zap is actually really fast. Um, yeah. So anyways, I can at least tell people that this is the reason why I chose Zig. You know, at least, uh, you know, so it's more objective rather than subjective. So now let's talk about what is Zig, right? I, um, what they, so Zig team will say it's a simple language. I do not agree. I think it's a somewhat simple language. It's not as simple as you think it is. They have something called comp time, which is you can think of it as uh, macros, things that happens during compile time. And what you can do with it is a kind of pretty amazing. Um, so as you know, um, Zig is not a dynamic language at all. However, however, it can do something, you know, it can do something called duct typing, which is very similar to what Ruby's and other dynamic languages can do, just using compile comp time. In fact, just the other day, one of the blogs I wrote about is how you can use Zig almost as a algebraic data type which is something that you use extensively in Haskell. Um, that is not something that you can do normally in a static language, but you can, I mean, not static, I mean, in a, in, in a low level language like uh, you know, C or something, but however, you can do this with the help of comp time. And um, another thing is that Zig, as I said, is not just a programming language, it's also um, what I would consider to be a build system. So, it can actually coexist and help out on C and C++ programs. You can use it as a compiler and as a build system. And this is the reason why Uber happens to use Zig. And I'll talk more about how Uber is using Zig. So programmers always love to see hello world. This is hello world. Um, it's really not that different. Other than the empty braces at the end of uh, you know, print statements, it just really looks like any, any C-like languages, right? It's, uh, so once again, it's really just like C with some weird syntax. So why I say it's a somewhat simple, it's not actually that simple. Um, so first of all, one of the things core tenant of a uh, Zig design is that there should not be any hidden control flow. And uh, so they don't have things like, you know, how programming, like um, it doesn't have a prop, um, app property like D does. It doesn't have, you know, getters and set automatically generation of getter and setters for a lot of languages. Um, everything should be, you know, obvious. Um, there are no operator overloading um, and there are no exception handling. There are actually no exceptions. Um, Zig does have error handling. It does not have exception handling. You will see something like try and catch a try and catch are different uh, specific um, syntax, which is not exceptional handling. Um, another thing is that what makes Zig also a good alternative for languages like Rust is that it also cares a lot about memory, um, memory allocation. However, I would not call Zig a safe language. It's somewhat safer, but it's not a safe language. However, it gives you full control of memory. So this is something, and also it's very explicit. If you have a function that takes in an allocator, that function will most likely be allocating memory. If you don't have allocator passing to a function, there's no way for you to allocate memory in any way or form. So when you look at a signature of a function, you know almost exactly whether that function will, will actually manipulate memory or not. And as I said, there are no preprocessors and there are no macros. So earlier I said it's a little bit, it's not as simple as C, for example. Um, as you can see, um, this is a little bit more complex. Um, test is actually built into this language. Um, so you can, you know, this is just a way to write a test. And one thing you can see, there's an allocator, right? You have to have an allocator. And as soon as you have an allocator, you allocate something, 
um, they have introduced something called defer, allows you to be able to say, before you exit this block, um, do this. So defer is a way for you to you know, uh, deallocate memory or deallocate resource or call the destructor. So, um, so there are things that Zig added. And all of this, as I said, is that very cohesive. It actually makes a lot of sense once you start using it. But what I want, I wouldn't, um, I'm not trying to gonna explain you know, what every line of the code does. I just wanna show you an example of a program that's a little bit more complex than a normal hello world. And this is something that um, comp time, right? I remember I mentioned earlier that comp time allows you to do certain things. So comp time, for example, in this case, it's a function that returns that type. So it's metaprogramming without macro in actually, so you can call any function that you want. So comp time is very, pop, very popular, very useful, very powerful, but you know, it's a talk by itself. So I'm not gonna talk more about comp time at all. Uh, just to give you a flavor of you know what when people say come time come time come time what does it do this is what it looks like you have a keyword come time so uh, it is LLVM based um, you know just almost all new languages are um, and what makes uh, it actually optimizes by default it will do a lot of things that other language would call link time optimization it will do all enable almost everything by default. What makes this interesting is that the tool chain for compilation, for cross compilation is included in the core download. So I don't know how big it is. I think it's 40 megs or about 60 megs or 80 megs. It's no, I definitely it's smaller than 100 megs. It includes cross, cross compilation for all the 46 or 60 targets that you can do. So you have one tool you download it allows you to cross compilation for all the targets that generally you care about. So um, I will talk about how you can, as I said, this is a C++ group. So I will talk about how you can actually use it as just a compiler, right? You don't use a language at all. You just use it as a tool chain for it to compile stuff. So this is a C program, right? Hello world. As you can see, if I call zig cc, it will compile as a C, um, it will, it's not a front to your other, you know, clan compiler on your, you know, on your system. It really is a C compiler by itself. And you can see that uh, this compiles. And C++, same thing with C++. Instead of saying zig CC, you say zig C++, it will compile a C program, a C++ program as if you know, you're using GPFS. And one of the power of Zig is that allows to cross compile without downloading a lot of stuff. In this case, you, um, I actually, um, as you can see, I have a Windows laptop. So I run Linux on WSL. And, um, and so I, on WSL, I'm able to you know, compile, cross compile for Windows and then pass the binary to window, my Windows, and then I can run the Windows program, right? Um, same thing with C++, I can do the same thing with C++. You just, um, there's a, actually, I think last time I checked, you, um, there were like 60, so for libc, it actually includes libc um, in, in the implementation, so in other words, uh, I think there were about 60 different targets you can compile to that has libc already built in. So you don't even need to use the system's libc at all. So I talk about cross compilation and this is the reason why Zig is actually using Uber. So how is Zig used? Um, one of the reasons is actually ARM64. Uber was experimenting and was wanted to actually expand to making sure that code also runs on hardware that runs ARM64 chips. So um, this is actually the official reason. Um, and again, I'm not gonna put in code links, just do a Google search on Uber Zig. You should be able to find a blog uh, written by, I, I'm gonna butcher his name, so I'm not gonna mention his name. Um, um, but you, you, there are actually also on YouTube, there's also a talk 
about how Uber uses Zig. Um, it's all about build system. The reason they do initially the motivation is to make sure their code also runs on ARM64. So how is Uber actually is using Zig is that Uber has is a huge Go and the Java shop, almost mostly Go actually. They have a mono repo. They have everything in the same repo for Go programs. And um, however, they have different libraries within the Go repo that um, sometimes they will they will compile on the system side that they won't. The reason is that is that initially when they first started, it's not what it's not a hermetic tool chain. What that means is that it does not use it, it will a hermetic tool chain is something that will only use you know the um, the build um, the build tool chain itself. It won't use the library residing on the host. So in this case, they have a lot of things that were using different libraries on the host. So they have to slowly and you know metic um, meticulously moves everything to make sure that they only use the tool chain that was provided. It's a C++ tool chain. And the way they actually, eventually they actually started using 6CC to be able to compile everything. I'm not sure this is a typo on the blog. I should have probably ask because 6CC is usually for C programs. 6C++ is for C++, but um, it was written this way. So I'm just gonna put it this way. Um, originally it's based on um, Bazel 6CC. It's a program that written also on and GitHub, you can search for it. They, they actually improve on it. They fix on the bugs, they you know, expand it on the capability. So this is where it left is where they were originally. Originally they were thinking about doing something like this because they have three different hosts uh, architectures and they have five different types of targets. So if they were, or if, or if they were using the regular LLVM based C++ toolchain like G++ or something, they will need 15, they need to have 15 different tarballs they need to download, which is about 1.5 gigs. However, by using Zig, they are only using, you know, the Zig, which is basically they includes, the program uses, they include the download tar file includes every single um, support files they need. So in other words, they only need to download three, you know, one, um, one tarball for each, um, for each host architecture they need. So I'm going to talk about a case study I did for this talk, right? Um, gRPC. If you go to GitHub, you download gRPC, you realize that gRPC is actually not a small program. It's actually a fairly complex uh, involved program to compile. It's a C++ um, repo. They use, um, you can, they use CMake for you to build it. And um, actually initially, and then it has 24 different dependencies. Um, so in other words, when you're compiling gRPC, it also compiles dependencies for you. So in other words, your compiler will actually go through, it, it will it's a good practice of your, a good exercise of your compiler to make sure that uh, everything works. And interestingly, um, now it looks very simple, but actually took me a lot of uh, many days of trial and error, but the command on the right side, the right most side, is the one command I use. And then once you do that, it will actually prime your system to be able to build everything using Zig. So in other words, you, I just need one Zig command and I'm able to replace all the C++ compilers that, you, that I don't need to download at all. And I'm able to um, compile gRPC and make sure everything works. That's Zig, it's just, so this is uh, what makes Zig so useful as just a, just a build tool. However, um, it's one thing to replace a compiler. It's another thing to replace a build system. Right? Earlier, you see that gRPC still needs something, you know, still needs C, CMake. Still, um, so you need actually a build system in addition to just a compiler if you have something that's more complex. And Zig actually provides a build system as well. The way it works is that you just call Zig init exe, and it will provide, it will add one, it will add one file in particular, it's called build.zig. And this is the name of the talk as well. Build.zig is a program written in Zig that allows to compile 
programs. So they don't install using make files. They actually use a program written in the same language and allows you to describe everything you need, the tendencies, all those things. So this is what Zig build out Zig allows you to do. So you only have to think about one language. This is what build out Zig usually look like. I remove all the comments. Um, it's actually fairly easy to understand, right? It tells you just specify what kind of targets you need, what kind of optimization options that you need. And you say, you know, I want to add an executable. And from that, I just say, you know, what my root source code, which is basically my entry point, where my main is. And after that, you just call install artifact. It will automate, it will compile. Of course, it can be very much more complex, but this is what uh, build out Zig usually looks like. And here's a more complex build out Zig. So it tells you that it can do things that usually a make file or another build system allows to do. You can, in this particular one, this is actually a build, uh, a, chunk, a section of the build.zig I took out from um, uh, the build.zig for a way to compile DuckDB. So it, uh, when it's very small. The only thing you need to see that it's possible, right? It can be, it can be simple. It also can be more complex. That's the idea. I just, um, as I said, I'm not gonna go through every single line, tell you what they do, but it tells you, but one of the things that you wanna see that it will actually allow you to be able to, you know, uh, say, hey, if for Windows, include those libraries, for Darwin, which is for Mac OS, you do this, for Linux, do something else. So it allows you to do all the things that you normally do in a make file, in a build system that you can do in the source code directly. So, well, again, I'm going to show you an example of how this is done. Uh, C++, right? Uh, so this is a C++ group. I'll show you what it does. So simple program, hello.cpp, right? It just, um, oh, by the way, for um, there's much better support because Zig is trying to, the idea of Zig is ideally is going to be complementary or replace some of the old C code. So they put a lot more focus on C rather than C++. For them, uh, C++ is a different battle. It's for a battle that Russ will deal with, um, whereas C is their home turf. So this is, um, so they put a lot more. So for C++, they definitely, um, they it basically has external C, okay? So there's no automatic binding for C++. You actually have to do your binding yourself. So anyway, so this is a binding for a simple hello world. C++, right, very simple. And because that you also need to expose your function in a header file, but in this case, it's dot .h, not dot .h, uh, .hpp. And this is what, how you would normally use a C program or C++ program, right? You, instead of, you see how there's C import and C include, those are special, Oh, by the way, um, one of the things that makes, I think makes Zig difficult to learn is something called built-in. Anything that starts with uh, the at sign is what they call built-in. Um, I felt like this is actually, even though it makes sense after you learn it, but in the beginning when I first looked at language, yeah, I didn't realize that you have to learn a lot of, so after you learn the syntax, you also have to learn the built-ins. For example, like casting, is all in, done in built-ins. It's not a function, it's actually a built-in function. So um, those are things that are special. It's a, that's why I say it's somewhat simple, but it's not that simple. So anyway, so in this case, you can see how it actually uses and just calls the C++ function. And this is the build um, dot zig that you need in order for this to compile. You can see there are extra things that's included. You have to include the source code for the C++ file, you also include the header file to make sure that it compiles properly. And one of the things it says link libcpp, which is a standard library for CPP. Um, Zig has their own version of that. And that's it, it just works. Once you have all those things, it will actually, um, the build system will, will build your program, the Zig program along with your C++ library. So 
as I told you, um, the version that people, um, they recommend people to use as actually the master branch, um, even though 0 0.10 was released, um, but 0 0.11 has not been released. It's always a good idea because there are so many breaking changes. Literally, there are so many breaking changes almost every day for me, at least for a while. Now it has been stabilizing for a while, but initially like I have a program that works. Tomorrow I update the compiler, it doesn't compile. And then update, again. okay, I made it compile. And then two days later, same thing happened again. Um, however, what, is, what I have to give credit where um, they wrote a program called ZIG FMT format, will automatically correct your program from the older version to the newer version. But unfortunately, not every, not perfect. So you yeah, still have to go through and try to fix it. But you know, this is just, uh, immature language, right? This is something you just have to experience. So, um, so how do you use a package? Um, I'm assuming everybody knows what package managers are, so I don't have to explain what package manager does. Um, so here's how you can use it. First of all, you have to list your dependencies for package manager. Then you have to add your dependencies into your build system. And then you have to import the library in your source code, and then you have to Call the function of that source code, right? I mean, this is a standard way of using any package manager. There is a special format. This is not JSON. Um, please, uh, this is definitely not JSON. Uh, there's a dot in front of the open braces. This is actually, this is um, actually what they call zig object notation because this is what they call anonymous struct in ZIG. So this is actually what we allocate. In, it will, will. So in this case, just think of it as like a JSON-ish thing where it tells you that we have one dependency. The dependency is called zap. It will tell you what the URL for the dependency is, and then it will require you to have the hash, um, which is really weird because if unless the, the publisher of the package tell you what the hash is, you, there's no way for you to know what the hash is because it's not really a hash of the tarball. So the best way I found is that you just put a random hash there and you run to say fetch the dependency. And then it will tell you, hey, your hash is wrong. This is the correct hash. Then I just uh, put it there. Okay. As I said, this is a, this is a immature, relatively immature language, um, but um, it's actually very useful already. It's just, you have to go through some quirks. All this will be fixed in 1.0. So you add it, as right? I told you like earlier, right? The dependency is called zap. So now I need to add zap into my, um, into my build file, right? You say, hey, I have a dependency called zap and I need to add it as a module and I link the library that the module provides. Right. So this is how you add a dependency, for example. And then in your file, you just say, you know, import zap, just like you do for any zig pro package. And just call a function. And that's it. You just call zap, blah, 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 whatever you need to do. This is how the package manager works. Um, and then not how it works, how you use it as a user. So I want to give you an example of how to use it. However, um, this is fairly involved. So I will tell you what it is. And uh, I'll ask you to read a blog I wrote because it's very involved. It's going to take more than an hour just to talk about this. So, but this is very, it's very, this is actually something that I assume should be very familiar for anybody who worked in a company before, right? You have a package you need to use but you want to isolate that package. You don't want that package, you want to import it in one place. You want to make sure you isolate that entire one package. However, the package you use is a different language. So you need to kind of put a wrapper on, around it. So that, therefore, the way I normally do it is I do three different packages. I have a package that isolates whatever in that other languages. And then I have another package that's a wrapper for that package. And then I have the final package which uses those the wrapper, uh, which indirectly uses the actual um, library in the different language, right? This is a, how very typical 
um, best practice for anything that you normally use. So how do you, um, so how do you do this? Well, uh, the example I want to give is something is DuckDB again. Um, actually, how many of you actually know what DuckDB is? It's so like SQLite, except it's column based instead of row based. But it's SQLite, so it's SQL. It's not any of the new NoSQL, it's a uh, SQL, except it's uh, the way they store data is column based, but you just use it as a SQL language. I mean, SQL database. It's also like SQLite in the sense that it's, uh, you should, uh, it's used as a library instead of actually a stand. Usually you use it as a library instead of a standalone database. Anyways, so it's also another C++, uh, it's another C++ library. So um, this, you can actually find my blog and also will find the code. I actually, uh, um, all the code is, um, I put the code on, you know, on GitHub. Um, so I said uh, there are three different packages. The first package is libdb, which basically uses the .so file from the release of DuckDB. I don't, uh, in this particular use case, I did not try to recompile everything myself, even though the DuckDB source code is available. I just felt like uh, I just wanted something that works. So I just uh, used the .so file. And then I have duckdb.zig, which is a package I wrote that allows you, uh, basically it's a wrapper, it's a very simple wrapper. There's like only five functions. I, Cause I only, for the, my test program, I just needed five different functions. So I just, you know, wrapped around five functions of, you know, what, um, like very simple things like run, execute a SQL statement, return the return, um, return value of the SQL statements. Those very simple things. And, um, so package duckdb.zig relies on lib.duckdb. And then finally, the third one, I call it Hunter, but it's just, just a program. It's um, when you read the blog, it will make sense. It's just a program that's written in Zig that uses um, duckdb, right? So it uses duckdb through the duckdb.zig um, package, which indirectly will also bundle whatever it needs from lib.duckdb. The reason why I said I read it somewhere else is because there were so many problems for making something simple like this to work. There were a lot of problems. Um, there were a lot of hacks. In fact, I, um, I was berated for using the hack. The idea is that if it's hacky, instead of writing a blog about it, I should have tell the core team to fix it. But then, you know, as you know, if you file an issue, it can take a while, right? And uh, for somebody like me who just want to make things work, if I, if I didn't have to go through this, if someone else did it already, it would be great for me to know about it. So I don't have to go through the same, jump through the same hoops. So I wrote it anyways. As I said, um, sometimes um, my view of certain things are different from how the core team views certain things. So I wrote, um, one of the blog I wrote is uh, WTF is Zong, uh, you no know, SIG. Um, object notation, but actually I go through the package manager, right? Go through how to use it. I basically analyze what are the hacks you need to do to make it work right now. I know everything will be fixed in 1.0, but I can't wait, right? I mean, if I need something to work, I can't just wait for somebody to fix it. I need to fix it myself. So um, as I said, you know, if you didn't read the blog, I just tell you it's very complicated. It's not as simple as you think. All right, so finally, I wanna talk about, you know, what the future holds. Not the future holds for SIG, but future holds for all the things I mentioned in this talk. Andrew, just I think a week ago or so, or maybe two weeks, one or two weeks, he's, he actually mentions that he doesn't want SIG to depend on LLVM anymore, which means things like ZIG CC, ZIG C++, won't work anymore. However, um, the, the way to make it work is that instead of being part of ZIG directly, it's a ZIG uh, executable directly. So instead of calling ZIG, you know, ZIG space CC, ZIG space C++, 
most likely they're gonna have somebody else do zig cc zig c for plus as you know its own command as, as its own executable to the, the the good thing is that instead of about 40 megs for zig executable it will be only five megs to streamline the whole zig program itself right? i think it's a good idea um we'll see but this is something uh, andrew proposed so as you know if you are the creator of a language anything you propose are most likely going to be approved right away so this is the way it's going to work in the future so if there's one advice, I highly recommend trying Zig. I told you all the ugly stuff of Zig, so you don't have to say WTF yourself. You can at least uh, you know have a, you know. Um, there's a reason, right? I said a lot of things about Zig, but at the same time, I think Zig is amazing. I love the team, and uh, I'm actually building my new startup on Zig, using Zig basically as the language I choose. So here are the resources. I didn't, I, once again, I didn't do, I, I did not do any of the links um, because, I mean, we are in Silicon Valley, just Google, right? Just Google or Bing or whatever you use, just search. Um, there's uh, one GitHub, uh, there, get, Zig is on GitHub. Um, there are two discords. Um, I know of that somewhat semi-official. There's an official, there's an official Zig um, discord, and there's also, software you can love Discord, which even though it's supposed to be about conference, but people there are, are we use it for everything. <laughs> we use it. So it's very annoying because I have to keep track of two different Discords for, uh, for Zig, but you know, it, it is what it is. And then the blog, I think Zig.news is probably the de facto. And uh, because as I said, uh, the team really does not like, um, they, they shut down, um, they actually shut down Reddit. Um, you guys know what happened, right? But they, they not only just uh, went blank, um, black, they actually shut down. And in fact, um, from my perspective, I think it's a bad idea. I think people still rely, a lot of people still rely on, especially some of the questions and answers that people already have answered before. I think they should at least be available for people to see. But you know, as I said, it's a very idealistic group of people who uh, usually run things. So um, they basically shut down. And then so now everybody should be using ziggit.dev, which is self-hosted. So you don't have to go through the corporate BS of uh, Reddit, according to, that's the, that's the, uh, that's the motivation. Um, oh yeah, um, so if you are like me who uses Windows and uses WSL, I, I know there's a lot of, you know, I know a lot of people really does not like Snap, but I found Snap to be a godsend for trying out Zig. So you just run one command and it will install Zig. And then if you don't like it, you can remove it right away using one command. And it will, you can refresh it whenever there's a new version come out. So it's very easy for me to do. I found it to be much, much easier than going to the website, checking whether there's a new version, downloading it, and then un untar the tarball and then make it work. I just I, I just found, I, somehow I found Snap and I just thought, hey, you know what? This is great for trying out Zig. So if you have Ubuntu or if you have, uh, you know, um, WSL on your Windows, um, this is awesome. And that's it. That's me. And I uh, thank you for coming here. Do we have any questions? curious about the memory allocation. Um, there's an awful lot of functions you might call if you've imported them into a Zig program that allocate. Um, does your Zig code really not compile if you're calling a, a system call, say, that allocates and you haven't specified an allocator? It's not like a system call is going to use some so, allocator. So what I found is that, uh, thank, um, so I don't need to repeat a question, do I? Um, I don't, no. right? Okay, okay. So um, for, for things that's more complex than memory allocation, if you're importing a library that's not written in Zig, if, uh, um, um, remember earlier I mentioned that um, I tried um, DuckDB. So DuckDB actually allocates its own memory, right? It, it doesn't care about Zig because it, no, it has no comprehension that Zig exists, it's calling their function. So no. So 
they cannot do anything with that memory allocation. So, um, that means that if you're using, for example, lib, um, um, DuckDB, for example, the way I use it, it will automatically allocate memory without Zig knowing about it. And at the same time, you need to call the DuckDB library to free the memory that you allocated. So um, it's separate. If you're, not writing, if you're not writing everything Zig, then the memory allocation is, you know, it, for that library is something that you have to deal with yourself. And I said, as I said earlier, Zig does not try to be Rust in the sense that it will force you to be correct. It gives you ability to make it more correct, but it doesn't, it it's actually allows you to do a lot of things that you can do in C. You can still do in Zig. You just have to be aware that you're doing things. That's all it does. It doesn't forbid you for doing so. Anybody? Oh, oh. I think, uh, probably it wasn't mentioned, but uh, my understanding is a Zig compiler is uh, incrementally cached. So, uh, yeah, it's not going to rebuild from clean every time, right? You, you, you basically reminded me to tell people that, yeah, thanks. Um, so, yes, one of the benefits of using Zig, um, well, this is a, it's because Zig is not only just as compiler, Zig is also a build system. So, as you know, that when you do something like a make, you don't, when you run make multiple times, if it's already built, make won't rebuild it. Zig actually has spent a lot of time making sure when you compile something in their own cache, they will automatically making sure that um, if nothing has changed, even if the dates or time has changed, it will not recompile it. So it's optimization. There's, a reason, uh, there's another benefit of using Zig as a compiler or as a build system. Um, Andrew is very proud of the fact that he actually has done a lot of work to make it work because M time lies a lot. So in order to make it work, he actually gone through and learned did a lot of things to make it so that uh, it will be smart enough to not rebuild something if the content does not change. Uh, there's a question from the Zoom chat. What is the future of Zig for embedded systems? What's the, it's a, you mean future? Future. Future. Um, I don't know. I, I know. Um, I know there's actually a core group of people working on it. And I know there's a lot of interest in that. Um, actually, there's a, several talks about it. That in, I don't know. Uh, I think it's something that Zig actually pays a lot of attention to. So it's something that is for the future, it's something that they will pay a lot of attention to because they are paying a lot of attention right now. But because I don't work with embed systems, um, I, I do know that it's one of the most important things at least for the future of Zig, because um, I mean, Zig really wants to see is their turf. I mean, it really is their home turf. If the way they look at it, it really is they want to ideally replace C. Hi, um, can you talk a bit more about the package management, package management uh, ecosystem? If I were to write a build system for an existing C++ project, I might want to use Boost or a lot of other common libraries. Are those packages already published somewhere or how many of these would I might have to write myself? When, when you say you're talking about like uh, if you're using, if you're using Boost, for example, you want to see if there's somebody already done the work to make it work in SIG. Is that the question? Okay, okay. Um, so that's a good question because I can tell you that, I'm, okay, so if you already, if you have a C++ program, you have C++ program that has a lot of, it needs to use a lot of dependencies. If you're using Zig, build out Zig to build it, you know, um, what's already built in, so I don't, you don't need those packages anymore. Am, am I correct? Okay. So <clears throat> what's interesting about, so I can tell you that one of the problem, I can tell you my, from my experience, what happened, okay. So remember I mentioned earlier when I tried to build gRPC, which has a lot of dependencies. What I found is that if I build gRPC 
initially using just regular, say, for example, let's just um, using the regular CMake. And then I wrote an example program that uses gRPC and try to use the libraries it makes. It won't compile. What I had to do is to recompile everything initially using build Zig and then link to the one that's built by Zig. And then it works. C++, um, um, the way when I was asking the question about how to make it work, I was told that the ABI for C++, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of BS. So it's very difficult to make it work. Um, and I don't know enough to tell you what the BSs are, but um, it was, it, so if you're using build.zig just as like a replacement as makefile, I think you should be okay. But if you're using it to build, um, to, to, because I think this is what Uber does in some way too, but except in stuff for C++, they use it for Go, right? But if you're using it as a way to, um, to remove some dependencies, I don't think it's there. For C, libc is already included. So you can remove a lot of dependency on that. But for C++, no, not yet. All right. I think we're going to, unless it's super, super short. OK. Last question. How well is debugging with GDB or with uh, Clang DB supported? I'm sorry, could, could you repeat that? How well is debugging supported? Debugging, OK. How, how well is debugging supported? Um, debugging is supported very well. Um, GDB, all those things actually all, all work. Um, of course, you, um, you know, um, it's just, I think it's actually, if you, you really, I mean, the, the C-like ecosystems are very well done. Let me say it this much. So if you can do something with C right now, you can, pre, I can fairly certainly say it can be done in Zig right now. But if it's C++, not so much. All right. Well, everyone, let's give a big thank you for Ed here. You for the talk. And also a big thank you for JFrog for sponsoring us. Awesome.